Happy Memorial Day, Remembrance Community Church, friends, family, neighbors. We are so glad that you are here. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament prophet of Joel, and we will be in chapter 2. And today I'm really excited. We are going to learn from Joel um, one of the truths about God that is my favorite truth about God. And here's what it is. God never wastes a hurt. God never wastes a hurt. I don't want you to hear that. I'm not saying that God never allows us to go through things that hurt. That would be absurd. All of us have been through things that hurt. We've been through hard times. So many of us, probably all of us, are going through hard times right now. But here's an amazing encouragement. God won't waste any of that. None of our hurts will be wasted because God is always up to something good. And so when we say God never wastes a hurt, all that we're saying is this. It means that God will always use every circumstance for something that is ultimately good. God is always up to something good. And probably you've known some people who you would say they're usually up to no good. <laughs> I was like that as a kid. Usually a little bit shady, and suspect and often up to no good, but our God is always up to something good, always. Often it's not easy or even possible to see what God is up to though, is it? So sometimes we just can't understand why God is allowing certain things to happen. That's true too. We won't always know why? But that's why it's so important, because sometimes all we can do is stand on this truth. God never wastes these hurts. I remember as a young father, my eldest daughter, Rachel, she was, she was very young. She was a toddler. She was walking all over the place, barely speaking any words, and she had a, a childlike understanding. And one day, we were at my mom's house, and an accident happened, and she cut her lip open. And right away, I knew she's going to need stitches. So as a dad, I grabbed her, and I was controlling her bleeding and holding her tight, and we rushed her to the emergency room. And soon after that, they brought us into the surgery room, and I remember I'm holding her tight, and, and I had to lay her down on the table lay her down on the table and hold her while they put this thing called a papoose, which is basically like they wrapped her up tight as a burrito. She couldn't move her arms. She couldn't move her legs. And then I had to walk back and let the professionals go to work. And I will never forget the look on her face. She was looking straight at me while she was crying. And she didn't have the words, but I could tell what she was thinking. Dad, why are you letting them hurt me? Dad, why are you letting them do this? And whenever I think about the question, why is God allowing such and such to happen? I remember that moment because I had to stand back and I had to allow them to do this because I knew it was what was best for her. I, there was nothing I could say to her. She couldn't understand, but I wanted to say, honey, you're going you're gonna to thank me when you're graduating from high school or getting your wedding photos that you don't have a cleft lip. You're going you're gonna to be happy that you did this, but right now, I know it hurts. I wish I could take it away, but because I love you, I have to let this happen. How often is that a great analogy for when we're going through hardship and God allows it to happen. And we may never know why, but what I'm saying is this. We can know this. Our good God, our compassionate God, he never wastes a hurt. He's always up to something good. He's never up to something shady. He loves us. He's for us. And as we dig into this Old Testament, uh, uh, chapter two of Joel, I wanna remind us of a few things. People of God had experienced really hard 
circumstances. A plague had come and wiped out the land and their economy was shut down and things were just not looking good. The people had experienced hurt and hardship. And God has been reminding them through this prophet Joel that that he has a deep covenant love for them. Like Scott McKnight says, that God's love for us is like a rugged commitment. Our Heavenly Father has a rugged, loving commitment towards us. And God wants to have a deep, intimate relationship with His people. God wants a relationship with you. And God wants a relationship with me. And the people have been called to to turn back to God with all of their heart. And as we've seen in Joel, that he's a good God, that he's a loving God, that he's a compassionate God. And the people have done what the prophet prescribed. He said, turn back to God, call a sacred fast, have a corporate gathering where you'll pray and and return back corporately together your hearts to God. And they've done that. And now Joel chapter 2, verse 18, through the rest of the chapter, which is chapter 3, is God's response. And listen to this in Joel chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and spared his people. The Lord answered his people. Those people are feeling like maybe... Maybe God's abandoned us. Why is God allowing this to happen? He reminds them, no, I love you. And then when God responds, it says he was jealous for the land. And he answered his people. God answers. And here's something that we learn right here in the beginning. That our God is a hopeless romantic. Our God is a hopeless romantic. And please don't hear that wrong. I think sometimes we... We get all uppity about things like this. He said that, that God was hopeless and, and now I was describing God. No, all we mean by a hopeless romantic is that God will go to great lengths for us because he loves us. It reminds me of a song that, that we sing sometimes called Reckless Love. And when that first came out, some people were like, you can't say God is reckless. No, no, it just means that God's love is so deep that he'll stop at nothing, even sending his son to die on a cross. That would feel reckless to us. God's not reckless, and God's not hopeless, but God loves us with a reckless love because God is a hopeless romantic. And and here's some, some things in this passage that remind me of this. One, think about this. This language in chapter 2, all through this whole, this whole book of Joel, is, is written in a poetic form. God answers them in a poem. Who does that? Who writes poetry? Hopeless romantics too. Now here's the thing. My dad was a great dad. He was a police officer for 29 years, and when I was up to no good, which was often the case, Here's how my dad would respond. He would often just report yellow legal pad, and he would write me a po- police report style letter, all capitals, just like his police reports. It would have all of the incriminating evidence and the prescribed punishment it was all in this letter. My dad loved me and he wanted to correct me and he would write me a letter. But it wasn't a poem because my dad loved me, but But God writes this corrective, loving letter, and he writes it in the form of poetry. And not only that, he starts it out by reminding them he is jealous for us. When he says, I'm jealous for the land, that's poetry. But he's talking to the people. I'm jealous for you. Our God is jealous for us. Now, jealousy can be the right and perfect and most appropriate response. Often when we think of jealousy, we think of the negative connotation, like don't be so jealous. But there is a a moment, like think about a husband 
and a wife. If a husband and a wife go to a social gathering and the wife witnesses uh, a husband and, and some lady drunk or whatever comes up and hits on her husband, she should be jealous. Or if a husband sees some guy walk up and, and, and try to pick up on his wife, he should be jealous. Now, I'm not going to tell you what, what, what I think he should do in that moment. I just want, want to remind us, jealousy in that moment is just an expression of this deep love and this reminder that they have this exclusive love relationship between a husband and a wife. And God uses this language for us. God is jealous for us. When we walk away and flirt with the world, the Bible uses that language. God gets jealous because God is a hopeless romantic, deeply in love with us and wanting nothing in the way, nothing tainting that beautiful, exclusive covenant relationship. Our God is a hopeless romantic. And our God has great plans for us. A a, a little while earlier, before Joel was alive, there was a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote during the time when when Israel was was punished by by being sent to exile into Babylon. You, You read about the story in Jeremiah, but also in the book of Daniel. That's that era. But in Jeremiah 29, 11, God is very clear with the people. You've you, you've been unfaithful to me, and now I'm, I'm going to send you into exile. You're going to be there for 70 years. It's going to be hard, but know this, he says, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I'm allowing these hard circumstances of 70 years to come, but even Even now, before it begins, I want you to know it's because I love you and I'm not going to waste this hurt. I have good plans for you. Paul says something similar in Romans 8.28. He says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. God has good plans for us. So we shouldn't be surprised when we move on in Joel, in Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 19, he says, he says, look, I'm about to send you grain, new wine, and fresh oil. Friends, God wants to give us good things. And think about the things that these are to to these Jewish people. Grain, I want to give you bread. It It was symbolic of nourishment flourishing, having everything you need, sustenance, bread, and new wine. This this was a picture of joy, celebration. I'm giving you sustenance, nourishment, everything you need. And beyond that, joy and, 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 and celebration and fresh oil, a symbolic thing of, of anointing that I'll be with you, that I'll anoint you. God wants to give us good things. Jumping into verse 25, from verse 21, uh, I mean, from from the verse to to 25, he just gives a bunch of descriptions of things he wants to bless them with. You could read that later. In verse 25, he goes, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts ate. The young locusts, the destroying locusts, and the devouring locusts. That's the predicament that they've been in. A locust has a plague has come and wiped everything out and things are bad and here's God going I will repay you for the years that the the swarming locusts ate in other translations it says I will repay you for the years that the locusts wasted aka God will not waste this God will repay you restore you. There's good at the end. There's light at the end of the tunnel. There's good at the end of the tunnel because God will not waste a hurt or a plague or a pandemic or anything. God is not wasteful. And so here's the best response. this, This section is about how God responds. And then Joel in the middle of it says, 
how should we respond to the way God responds? How should we respond? And the best response is rejoicing. To raise a hallelujah. We sing that sometimes. Raise a hallelujah. Rejoice. Praise God. In verse 21, he goes, don't be afraid, land. Remember, that's poetic. He's talking to the people. Don't be afraid, land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done astonishing things. And then he says it again in verse 26. He says, don't be afraid, children of Zion. Rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God. Isn't that an, a, an interesting dynamic? He says, don't be afraid. Think about it. Bad things have happened. They're in the middle of a hard season. The plague had hit, and it was, they were still suffering from it. And in those moments, we get fearful. We get anxious. We start to doubt. We, we, might, we might think in that circumstance, he hasn't already brought the bread and the wine and the oil. He's only promised it. And so God goes, no, don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. I am coming. The promise has been made. Don't worry. Start rejoicing now. Don't wait till it happens. Rejoice now because you know who I am. We know who God is in the midst of our storm, in the midst of our struggle. We know who God is. So we rejoice now. We don't wait because we know, we know good things are in store. God has planned good things. This, God is going to use this somehow for good. I can trust him and I can rejoice. And he says in verse 26, you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. I could have just said you'll have, you'll, you'll barely squeak by. You'll, you'll just have enough. No, he goes, you'll have plenty to eat, and you'll be satisfied. It's the same language that when Jesus fed the 5,000, said he had five loaves and a few fishes, and he, he fed everybody, 5,000 plus, until they were satisfied. Because that's how our God works. He takes circumstances that feel like there's no way, and he always comes through. And he doesn't just give you barely enough. He gives you more than you need until you're satisfied. And it says, you will praise the name of the Lord, your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. We will praise God when we're satisfied. We can praise God now when we're struggling, maybe, because we know he's coming. We know he hasn't forgotten us. So really, in all circumstances, we can stand on this truth. God never wastes a hurt. You don't have to know why. You don't have to understand. It's okay to, to be struggling. It's okay to hurt when it hurts. You don't, have to, you don't have to pretend like it doesn't hurt. It's not what this is about. When it's hard, it's okay to act like it's hard. All he's saying is just remember while you're going through the pain, that I still love you. Never question that. Never wonder if I've left you. I will never leave you. I'm here, and I'm, my, my, my intention is to bless you. Sometimes I have to allow hard things to happen. I don't pretend to understand from God's vantage point as a human, but I can tell you this as a pastor. The Bible's clear. God has spoken. He loves you. He loves me. He loves us. And that's a great foundation for rejoicing. It's a time to praise. So as we, as we, as we get ready for worship, what are some things that we can maybe take away from this passage in Joel and this great truth that God never wastes a hurt? First, this. Let's take a moment and fix our eyes more on who God is. I realize like every day people are sending us links to videos that we have to watch and they're all 
terrible news and conspiracy theories and we all have ideas about what we should do next and what the church should do next and what the government should do next and what our neighbors should do next and whatever, right? All those things, I get it. But right now, I want to invite you to, to turn those things off and to fix your eyes completely on God and just remember who he is what he's done and what he's promised. And I believe this. If we will fix our eyes on the Lord long enough that it begins to, to sink in, if we'll do that, it will take root in our hearts and it will begin to, to stir up and the response that will come out, if we really do that, is that we're going to raise a hallelujah. We're going to rejoice. We're going to start to feel peace. Joy will start to return to us. The oil of his gladness will begin to restore and soothe and heal. And we, we, will experience the goodness of God, even here in the land of everything that this land is right now, which isn't perfect. So I just want to just give you a moment. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. As the, as the worship team begins to play some instrumental, we're not in a hurry. Think about what we've learned today. Maybe write some comments and share some of the things that you're thinking with each other. Have a little community discussion in the YouTube comments. And I wanna pray. And I wanna just, I'm, I'm praying right now that God's just gonna just stir up and that some of you are just gonna be like rejoicing. You're gonna be singing and I don't know who you are, but one of you guys is gonna just get up and dance. Maybe play the air guitar. Maybe, maybe play the air drums, and that's okay. Let's worship God together. Why? Because he is worthy of our praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this reminder from way back in the Old Testament that's still true today, that you never waste a hurt. I pray for those who are watching right now who are experiencing pain and suffering and worry and anxiety and hurt and anger and all of the things. I pray, God, that you would help them to take those things and, and not ignore them and pretend like they don't exist, but literally to just lay those at your feet and then look up at your face. And I pray that as we do that, that you would just begin to wipe away our tears, send, send peace and joy, and, and just remind us of your goodness. And I pray right now that you would just stir up a worship with the Remembrance Community Church that would shake the walls of your kingdom and knock down the walls of the enemy, and that this would just be a kingdom moment where we remember who you are, and we praise who you are.